So we're going to start with the Revenant. Well, first of all, I had to make an LA boy look like a trapper. He's meant to have been out in the wilderness for over a year when we come across him. And Alejandro really wanted Leo to look aged, so I did a bit of aging. I grayed, grayed his beard every day, which meant painting individual hairs in into his beard. Uh, that took 20 minutes alone. And then I had to break down his skin texture, add some scars, nicks and cuts to his hands. And then you get to the bear attack, where basically the whole of his body gets covered in injuries and wounds. Um, I, start, I, got, I, I started prepping in April 2014, and I wrapped in August 2015. So it was a long, long job, and there was a lot of prep involved. There were, just for the neck itself, there were seven different stages. Sometimes there were up to four of us working on him, and it took up to four and a half hours for the full body. For that scene, we had 47 pieces on that all had to be painted on the day because they were all transfer moulds onto his body. So there's 47 wounds for that kind of that day yeah, of the and that shoe. Took, How long that was the longest makeup. That look took four and a half to five hours. When you first received the script for The Revenant, do you break each scene down and design it? You know, you, you read the script, you see which characters are playing, and... and what they go through to get to certain scenes and accordingly. So every character will have his own look or particular evolution of a particular look to a particular scene. And you just, of course, it all changes throughout the filming of it with the director and the way he evolves throughout it. But generally, yeah, so reading the script, breaking down characters, scenes, and progression. They've been out in this wilderness for a number of months and obviously they're tired and fatigued and how do you work to kind of create an aesthetic that seems more and more worn as the film goes on? You know, trying to put yourself in the heads of the particular people that are in the film as the characters. How long were they there? What did they go through to try to think about what was done? I remember one of our coldest days being well into the minus 30s. And so to try to achieve the look for them there, you know, how would it look when it was that cold? How long have they been out there? And Alejandro wanted you to have separate stories for each of the trappers. Uh, absolutely. Alejandro wanted to have backstories to every trapper, why their hair was the way it was. He said we might never ever see that particular scar, or that particular bit of hair missing, but he said we'll know that it's there and he just wanted to know everything. So every, every character had, it, had their own story and it was a lot of fun and it helped me along with my job as well to understand where they were, why they were. Would you have like a couple of key pieces of kind of kit or makeup that you could not have lived without? Wine. Wine. Wine was very essential. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yes. Uh, I had a lot of products that um, I ended up using a lot on, on this. Dave Stoneman's Pus, Fleet Street's Blood, they were fantastic. The colours were so good. And, the, and, and also a product called Psoriasis, which I wasn't expecting to use on this film. It was really good for starting off the weathering and for blending in the lip pieces with the lips. Um, and it just sort of basically broke down the skin texture. So every job, I think you find something mm. that is perfect for that film. And then you add it to your arsenal of wonder products as you go along. How did the weather affect the makeup on this? Well, our prosade kept freezing. And we had to take certain products home with us at night to make sure they didn't freeze on the trailer. Because one day we got into the trailer and all our bags had frozen to the floor. I had to do the makeup in a hat and a coat. And Leah was wrapped in a blanket because it was so cold. Because um, our trailer had come from Vancouver and it wasn't designed really for the weather in Calgary. So, you know, it did... Uh, the, the biggest problem for us, though, was maintaining makeup on set because you think... You know, you've got hand prosthetics on, you want to make sure they look good. But at the end of the day, if your actor's going to get frostbite, you can't be worrying about whether the prosthetic is hanging off. The priority is to get his hands in the warm hair dryer that are going to distress the makeup even more. But that has to be a priority. Safety on a film like this is paramount. You have to take a back seat with the makeup maintenance and just be thinking about the safety of your actor a lot of the time. Thank you. So with The Danish Girl, um, it's obviously based on a true story and the transformation of Ina to Lily. Uh, what were your initial reference points? He was actually a middle-aged uh, woman by the time he became Lily. But the, the whole premise of the story was really about um, Gerda's vision of Lily uh, because Gerda painted Lily. And so Tom would always keep saying, look at the 
paintings, look at the paintings. And what was so lovely about that is all the paintings, very 1920s. Uh, she painted Lily with wonderful dark hair and red hair, which is what we ended up using in the end. So my reference points were all those colours. And also the production designer Eve had already started, so a colour palette was already there. We had wonderful cool colours in Copenhagen, and then when we went to Paris, all the colours warmed up. So when I first tested with Eddie, because we were very concerned about how much he was going to look like a woman, I tested all the colours that were in the paintings. And of course, Eddie looked great with dark hair, and he looked even better with the red hair, which is the one that won through. It's funny, when I worked with Eddie before on theory, there was always one side of his face that looked more masculine, and we seemed to shoot on that side. And for sure, um, it was the other side that was much more feminine, so that's how we based it. So that's why we were always showing his left-hand side, because it, it just, proportion-wise, if you, you know, when the camera was shooting one way and the other way, he just looked more feminine. So we, we used that, of course, and also angles and everything were really important. And as the film progresses and he becomes more feminine all the way through, but I imagine each one of those changes for you must have been quite a big change in terms of makeup. I mean, every film we all do, we break our scripts down. So I already knew the continuity of the film of every character. It's all broken down, you write all your notes out and you shoot out of order. But what I really wanted to do with Eddie's character in particular is that each time Einar had dressed as Lily and then had to dress back as Einar, I wanted to make sure that Einar became more feminine each time. It was like not being able to deny Lily's presence um, because, you know, Lily was really who she was, he was. In the beginning, when I made up Eddie as I, and I made him much more masculine. I hardened up his face a bit. I did a lot more highlighting and shading, made his face just a little bit stronger, you know, strengthened his eyebrows. He, he wore wigs all the way through. He had a wig on when he was I, and I because his own hair was too short to look 1920s. Um, so each time I just softened that masculine look and just made it more and more feminine. I'm going to go to Brooklyn now. How did you create her look for Ireland? I just kept it very plain and simple. Tiny bit of mascara, lip salve and very small bit of foundation. I had to keep it very, very light because there were huge close-ups on her in HD, which is terrifying. <laughs> and then she moves to Brooklyn and obviously becomes a woman in a way yes. and has her own independence. Yeah. How do you subtly change? I suppose the makeup was just to sort of map her internal emotions and how she changed. So I think her makeup changed when she met this Italian boy at a dance, and her friends brought her into the toilet and put lipstick on, and then she took it from there. But it was always a quiet, she wasn't a big fashion icon. It was very quiet, you know, sort of quiet sophistication, really. And in terms of her hair, Obviously, when you see her in Ireland, it's very pull back and very simple. Our director, um, John, he wanted just a little bit more Irish, and Saoirse is naturally blonde, so warmed up her hair with a little red, and then simple curls, and then when she went to New York, just slowly took a little influence from Grace Kelly look, a little sophistication, and tried to subtly turn her into a swan as she became more confident, a little bit more sophistication when she was working in the New York store and she meets the Italian boy and then goes back to Ireland and everybody in Ireland sees a big change in her and just very subtle really, you know. With Carol, for me it seemed there was a perfect marriage between the hair and makeup and the costume. I was particularly responsible for Kate Blanchett, but the costume designer was Sandy Powell and Actually, we did our first film together in the 1980s, which was Caravaggio. So it was really nice. I mean, speaking about the character of Carol, you know, we chose to go with all the coral colours. You know, Sandy did such exquisite costumes with grey, with flashes of coral. So I always used soft coral lips and nails. And of course, Carol's a very sophisticated, put together character. So it was a very chic, um, fashionable look of 1952 in New York. There's a definite contrast with Carol and Rooney's character, Therese. Mm. Rooney's character was more of a discovery character, so at the beginning, it's a bit like Brooklyn, really. She's working mm. in a department store and mm. she's very much more a girl and who hasn't discovered herself yet. And so she had a less complete look. She didn't really wear much makeup and she was still finding herself. 
I suppose the final question, what are the best and the worst parts of the job? The worst part is lugging your kit. It is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, lugging it, packing mm. it, yeah. packing bringing it home, unpacking. sending it out. It's awful, yeah. isn't it? That's the horrible bit. Everything else is quite good. Yeah. This is one of the best bits. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I would like to thank Robert, Sean, Jan, Mac, Mac Mon and Lorraine, <laughs> and Mac Cosmetics, and thank you all for coming. George kept bringing wind machines in closer and closer until all the wigs were being blown off, practically. <laughs> Is that why Charlize Theron didn't have any hair? <laughs> cut it all off. <laughs> so that, that then became a combination for Margaret Sixel, our editor, to put it all together. And the storyboard made sure that what the action unit got and we got was comparable and compatible.